Hey, what's up, nerds? It's Paul here at Radio Free Hammer Hall doing another episode of War Hammered. And tonight we're going to be talking about introducing the game to new players, uh, both from the perspective of new players and the perspective of the folks that are recruiting, teaching, guiding, mentoring, etc. Kind of all uh, is the same thing, I think. Um, Browbeating. Yes. Not brow beating. Press ganging everyone is doing mm. what we're going for. So I've got uh, Martin Orlando and Daka Dez here with us for the conversation. Two individuals that have, uh, they've been responsible for bringing a lot of people into the Age of Sigmar. So I thought you guys were the ideal candidates to have the conversation. I'm personally really bad at like teaching Age of Sigmar and like assisting new players. Um, I get asked questions like, oh, like what kind of list do you like at a thousand points? I'm like, I don't like any list at a thousand points. I don't play a thousand points. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so uh, that's why I have you guys here to discuss these sorts of things. So, um, I guess first, Martin, how's it going? How are you? Doing all right, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's an interesting subject to talk about because uh, Warhammer, I think, is an interesting at an interesting crossroads uh, of various fandoms. You'll get people who hear about it from the art world, where like you have miniature painting, and there's generally going to be at these larger competitions like Crystal Brush or um, like Muscle, or um, uh, and uh, you'll see people painting Warhammer figures with people like, oh, what's that? And okay, now now you have people thinking, not, not, not knowing what Warhammer is, but know what miniature painting is. You'll have people who, um, I think famously, uh, Joe Mag Maggianello, when he was uh, uh, touring Vanity Fair, I think, um, in his man palace, like the basement beneath his mansion, which is covered in D&D in &D stuff, like signed R.A. Salvatore portraits, um, giant statues of dragons, beholders, and of course, up on his shelf, is an Agash figure, Archeon figure, which he probably uses for D and D. So you have people who are new to, or who know what role playing games are, stuff that in in our sphere, but are using Warhammer miniatures, not necessarily knowing what they are. Um, and I think then the third possible road is like you have because these are model kits, scale models. So you have people who might go into a hobby shop, know what a model train is, model plane, submarine, car, etc and then see all of these fantasy figures, sci-fi figures, not knowing what it is, it says Warhammer on it. Um, and then people like us would come in and be sort of like that that gateway figure saying, here's the thing you know, Warhammer is like the thing you know, but also this, which makes it unique. Yeah. Yeah, my experience is mostly hanging out in game stores and somebody will walk in thinking they're gonna, you know, look for video games or something like that and instead you know they'll see painted armies on the table or in the display cabinets you'll get all excited seeing all this cool stuff what's this and it's kind of it's it's not my job but I, I love warhammer so i'll always, I'll always be the person that i'll walk up to them sometimes before the employees and start just babbling on and yeah precision babbling on because if you babble on and just give people too much information it's just gonna go right out the ears. Well, that, I think that's one of the unique advantages our hobby has. And I think Games Workshop of all of all companies, but all of these miniature companies capitalize on that fact, where it's like um, uh, Warhammer is a social experience. You can, engage, you can engage in the hobby, the general like miniature painting hobby, without really playing the game. Even though there's a conversation about Warhammer, where it's like people can just read the books, just pay, uh, collect a few, a few figures, paint a few of them, but the experience, the core Warhammer experience, is two people uh, standing in across each other, a game board with their miniatures, and um, they're going to be there, depending on the size of the game, up to two, two and a half hours, depending. Um, and that sort of interaction um, is effectively unique in gaming. Uh, yeah, it's it's anti it's like the the opposite of what people have come to expect out of gaming entertainment these days yep. so it's right. it's yeah I, th I think that um necessitates as you said that sort of a communal sales sales pitching where 
um, if I want if I want to get more uh, show new people that this is this is a cool thing, and uh, involve them in it, it does involve like trying to acclimate strangers. Just like hey, this is cool. We're not we're not we're not out to we're not out to bite you. Uh, this is yep. this this thing that you've not seen before is actually this really cool experience, and it might be worth a shot. That's another yeah. skill too. Is uh, is uh, trying to keep them away from maybe certain people at the game store. Maybe don't talk to that. Or come over here for a second. Don't, over, don't talk to these people. I'm talking to them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After we'll do a little bit of that. Yeah, I, I mean that, that person is the employees. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't talk to this guy with the uniform on. Come over here. We're gonna have a conversation. That that may that may vary. I I, I was just trying to speak generally of of okay. like um yeah it's it, there there is a minimum level of of social interaction required just from the outset. Yep. And um yeah new, newer people probably need to be prepared for that first of all, regardless of the time commitment because well the time commitment is it's its own animal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For for sure. It's funny how. People have a hard time committing sometimes to that time, yeah. And and, and then they'll they'll start playing and be like, "Oh, wait a minute, this is really fun." Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to like forget World of Warcraft and and my my raid tonight. I'm I'm gonna go play Warhammer. Yeah, and, and it's interesting too because it's like one game of Warhammer takes two to three hours mm -hmm. for the time. It's it's like three, uh, three hours is a bad word. Bad bad two words. <laughs> Let's not say three hours. <laughs> wow. I mean, let's be real. Like, if you're playing and you're socializing and you're not just in the game, and, like, three hours is pretty reasonable and normal. Yeah. Um, you know, do you get some games done in, like, an hour, hour and a half? Sure. Do you, do you breeze through some games at tournaments? Sure. If you're playing... Fire Slayers versus Nurgle. Are you going to be there all day? Yup. <laughs> yeah, that battle report that I did with uh, our buddy Raphael, that was Nurgle versus Fire Slayers. Uh, between filming it and playing the game, it took over five hours to get that game done. <laughs> Two armies that just won't die. Yeah. yeah, it was just a grind fest. Um, when, when, I, when I when I said the time commitment, I was mostly meaning like the hobby angle. It's like these these figures. Um, that's another thing that I think uh, when uh, Games Workshop announced the new CEO changeover, like from 2015, 2016 ish, and they said that they would be changing certain starter level products. Be worried, are they finally going to pull the trigger and do prepaid miniatures? Because at that time, X Wing was the the game. Yep. Like I think that was the first time that like X Wing outsold 40k, at least at that time. And people are like, are they going to do pre-painted miniatures? The answer is, uh, no, they never did. And so when you have a newer hobbyist, or it's like, um, if I mostly am going to be engaging in these two plus player war games, um, the miniatures I need, the materials I need to to participate in that activity, do not appear out of thin air, which means that I now have to not only buy the figures. I have to buy materials, regardless of where those materials come from. You could say, well, if they buy only the Games Workshop ones, they're super expensive. Doesn't matter. You'll still need to have you need to get your hands on glue. You need to get your hands on clippers, stuff to move mold lines. If they care about moving the like the mold lines, it's the model kit process. Um, and then you have to figure out where to put it when you're not using it, mm -hmm. and that is its own yeah. challenge, especially for people like me, who um, don't exactly have the largest amount of living space. And don't want my hobby taking over my life, <laughs> yeah. which is, I think, a position some people. <laughs> <laughs> people with Joe Maggianello-sized man palaces clearly don't have that issue, yeah. um, or or aspire to something equivalent. But uh, the the issue still is it's like it's not plug and play. That's another way that these, these miniatures, uh, games in general, any miniatures game is different from video games. Video games, I buy the game, boop, um, play and play away with it. I, I so, like, that's one of the things that I like about uh, the way they've been re redeveloping their paints, I guess. I, I think 
contrast paints was really smart because yeah. you yeah. prime something white and then you just paint your colors on it and it actually looks good in tabletop and it's mm -hmm. simple to teach somebody how to paint with contrast paint and it flips people out they, they love oh, yeah. it and then you know they just build up from there right yeah i know initially the painting side of warhammer was really wow. it was something i was not interested in like i came in from like i was playing magic for years and i gave up magic because it was taking up too much money that was yeah. the big thing and um like i quit magic like while my wife was pregnant with our daughter who was our oldest and then I picked up Warhammer shortly after she was born. Um, and it was, believe it or not, Warhammer is actually cheaper than Magic. Yeah. Um, oh, I believe it's cheaper than being a musician, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, like, so we, we, I, I'm sorry. I think, I think the um, one of the barriers for me for getting into it, because I had been introduced to it before that, it was just like, you mean I have to build all these models and collect all these models and paint all these models? Like, like you mean I can't go to a tournament if I don't paint everything? And that was like, that was a barrier for me. And I think that's probably yeah. a barrier for a lot of people that are like, yes. I don't know. How it, 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 it takes time. And like, and let's, let's like uh, focus on that magic angle. Cause I think ma magic is one of the more common things because, um, Larger stores, uh, hello coach and uh, chat gang. I'm sorry, is chat gang copyrighted? Uh, uh, Andrew will get <laughs> very angry with you if you use that. <laughs> he has copyrighted chat gang. All right, um, good to know. Uh, so, so larger game stores, I think, um, generally make their money off of magic if they don't sell comic books or something like that, or a combination of those two. And if there's a large enough space, there's probably going to be enough demand for miniatures games on top of that, especially in um, stores, I would say, that are outside of our region where space is uh, l less of a premium. Like, um, uh, I was watching a video of a, of a big YouTuber, millions of subscribers, who lives out in Arkansas, and one day he was going into his game store to talk about magic, and you could see all of the Warhammer stuff in the back, and, like, there were, like, five or six tables. And he made a joke where, like, the game store owner talked to him, and it's like, I'm thinking he was thinking he was it was this big video where it's like I think I'm finally getting out of magic and the game store like commenters just like you want to get into Warhammer and they just he 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 brushed it off but it's like it's a situation a lot of people find themselves in where there's that curiosity we go in to play magic I play magic I don't know how like uh, uh, at least like once a week Friday night magic or something like that you always see the miniatures and if you have decent painters in your community there's probably going to be a display cabinet filled with paint miniatures not only painted by the, the shop people but like people that you might know people you might play magic with paint some awesome looking models and so you get that curiosity so paul what other than um the time investment what other things stood out to you as clearly different um from magic get going from a card a card game to a miniatures game with the exception of the rules quirks, because that I think could be its own show. And I'm sure Vince or yeah. someone has yeah. done a show comparing game design and magic to Warhammer. Yeah. Um, one of the things that initially put me off was that it was a dice game. Mm -hmm. And it felt like it was too much about randomness. And then once I learned the rules a little bit more and understood what was going on, I'm like, oh, this is a game about probability, not randomness. Yeah. And that really kind of, that hooked me in, that connected with my math brain. And that got me thinking about it in a different way. Um, okay. That was, it, but the thing for me with like painting was like, like I had like, hadn't picked up a paintbrush since like art class in high school. Like, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was getting into. And if you look at painted models, like a, like even just like a tabletop standard army. Yeah, something you, you would see probably at a game, like on a shelf at a game store in a cabinet. Somewhere where it's like, oh. not someone like me painting it. Someone like just someone painted for the club or the store just to get it done. 
Yeah. If you just casually walk around and like look at tables as people are playing, if you don't understand anything about painting, that's incredibly intimidating. Mm -hmm. Like these people are so talented. How do you do this? How do you learn this stuff? Like how long do I, how much time do I have to spend to get this good? Um, like, am I going to be like embarrassed putting my stuff on the table across from these other people? Um, and initially, like, I just didn't care. I was like, oh, I'll slap paint on this stuff so I can play with it. I was interested in the game. Yeah. So um, just a quick question. Do you and Des go to the same hobby shop? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So this would be a question for either of you. Um, did your hobby shop offer hobby classes, like either on a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis? Yep. Every Tuesday night they have hobby night. Now we have – just huge tables that can seat like it's like 12 to 16 people and people will just go down there and hobby. And we always invite people that don't know how to paint or maybe never painted or want to see how it gets done to come yeah. down on those Tuesday nights. One of the things games workshop used to do back in the day when they were in the community center business, when they had like, you know, hobby bars and stuff. Um, you might, uh, Des might remember the, do you remember the Academy program? I do. Yep. <laughs> the Academy program is technically what got me into the hobby. Nice. Um, just a quick thing for Paul. It was a six week course. I believe it cost as much as a Citadel figure case. And you got the Citadel figure case at the end of the course for completing mm -hmm. it. And they took you through a different step of the hobby. Um, each time I think it was like week one was, was like, like reading and understanding like, this is what Warhammer is. Step two is building painting advanced painting and then maybe the last week was like a game and you went through like a demo game with some of the stuff you painted over the, the six weeks at the end you got the figure case you technically paid for six weeks ago um and i think um this this is of course this is probably the most the biggest obstacle for um uh like game stores it's like how, engaging with the newer people in your community on a level of like the, the training wheels, the baby steps and stuff like that on the hobby side. Uh, because if the games, uh, the game owner, um, a good, a good example is like, it's, it's not for everyone. Um, a game store near me. I, I don't want to use names cause I don't want to feel like I'm, I'm uh, pointing a, any sort of thing like that. Um, it's one of the largest magic, the gathering sellers on the East coast. And he has a room for about 12 to 15 tables. Um, and he's a great business owner. He ran an online magic business for 10 years before opening the game store. Um, he owns a 40K army that he didn't paint because he doesn't really paint. He only uses it for casual games. He doesn't know anything about the hobby. He would need to employ people or have people volunteer like me to run hobby courses. And so already you're a person mm -hmm. removed that's like not technically affiliated with the store trying to provide entry level like experiences for new hobbyists. And that's sometimes a big risk. So um, it, it, it really is on the community more than the stores because the stores, it will vary from store to store how they want to go about it. But I do think those, those, those hobby training wheels and saying it's okay, painting is different for everybody. <laughs> Here's how you can do it bit by bit. And um, I think what would be a uh, nice segue into the next subject is figuring out uh, what what level of uh, interaction people are comfortable with. Do they want to go full kit? Like, fuck it. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> I want to just, yeah. I want to get into this thing. Like, I'm going to go buy a $600 army right now, books, get into it. Or are people like, I really like that one box. Can I play games with that one box and that one character? And that's yeah. when you tell people about Warcry or something. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, Warcry has been awesome. Especially yeah. for new players around our area. Yeah, Warcraft is a great gateway drug. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, fun for the vets, too. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, one of the things that I would say about the painting, though, like talking more towards, you know, the newer players that might be intimidated by it, um, it's a lot easier than it looks. Mm -hmm. like the, sure. yeah, the coach mentioned it again, too, with contrast paint, way, way easier. Yeah, between contrast paints and just like learning like a handful of basic techniques, you go from like feeling like you don't know what you're doing at all to like being able to put out like 
just tabletop standard uh, miniatures in like no time. Like yep. you, like yeah. if you if you can just basically get down like base wash dry brush and like highlighting the details, like that. Stuff that, that doesn't involve brush control. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. It, it, I think the the thing that got me was when I realized that painting something 3D was actually a lot easier than 2D painting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and um, the really mind blowing stuff to me now is when I look at somebody's miniatures that have like a, a free handed banner that is really intricate. And I'm like, how do you do that? Like that is a completely different skill set. Yep. Um, I think uh, game stores also have the opportunity of um, when, when you are trying to teach people the, the baby steps, you don't have to use games workshop models, which can be expensive, especially if you're just even if you're buying like the $15 like sort of packs uh, Reaper Bones minis. Um, oh, yeah. Someone who has taught taught just general painting classes, Reaper Bones. And I think I think Reaper knew that going in. And it's like mm-hmm. these are the miniatures people are going to like test stuff on and some of them even come pre-primed like they just like they they had them on the assembly line just the machine spray them white throw them in the box vacuum seal the box ship it out they're like three dollars a miniature um and and sometimes they look like a character that um someone like might really be attached to uh but regardless it's like if you, if you get people if you bait them in with a cost effective way to just get over that fear of painting uh and I, I think when, once you get people like uh, it is like training wheels on a bicycle, it's like yep. if you get them going, they they might stick with it. Um, and tons of bones for my kids. Yeah, we paint them like crazy. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I uh, I my daughter's five and she has bones maze. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, my oldest, she's been painting since she could physically hold a brush. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And, yeah. and 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 get, getting back to the brush control thing, where it's like um, the one of the one of the biggest com- like um, I would say obstacles that I've heard from people who are getting who, who are committed. They understand where Warhammer is, and they're now taking the next step. Where it's like I don't, I'm not comfortable with painting. I, either it's like I uh, shaky hands, just in general. Some people are just like I have shaky hands, or um, I can't draw. I can't draw a stick figure right. That was one where uh, a friend of mine, she was like, I can't draw a stick figure right. And uh, there are any number of tutorials out there, plus like uh, what you can teach people. It's like, what techniques can you use to paint an army with a brush uh, uh, this long? Like the head of the brush is like this long, mm-hmm. almost like a, wa- a big wash brush. Yep. It's in, like, we're not, we're not using any detail brushes. Take those detail brushes, put them to the side. How can we paint an army without details? And that's where you get into the contrast paints and and the whole zenithal thing. Yep. Um, yeah. Use either the contrast, the installs, or or instars, or just even washes, like just regular washes. Um, if you do the zenithal from the top, I I, I, I I showed her how to paint. Here's like you can do a two thousand point witch elves army in a weekend. And hmm. some people do now for <laughs> tournaments. When I was judging Nova last year for the painting, I was like, I guarantee, and, and it doesn't look terrible. It's like I guarantee he painted that in a weekend. Like some, some of the people were there to play, I guarantee you. He figured out what he wanted, he built it, he washed it in the weekend. You, you um, without even using an airbrush, all over black, white from the top. If you do like the Reichland flesh shade over um, the Zenithal primer, it looks exactly what you needed to. Yep. And that didn't take any any fine detail, period. You're done. Hair, metals, skin, leather, basing material, you're done. You're out, done. Out of here. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you know the, the technique for shaky hands? Exhale. Uh, Exhale before you paint. Your hands oh. are shaking. Just like it, it's a shoot. It's actually a shooting technique. You exhale oh, okay. before you shoot. Yep. The same thing happens. Your mm-hmm. hands stop shaking, and you're able to. You get a little bit of a steadier hand. Also, if you put your wrists together, if you can. Yeah. Yeah. You do the whole bracing thing. Yeah. Elbows on the table, wrists together. Exhale. Yep. Yeah. So, other than painting, you know, getting people into the game and talking about, like, like, what do you guys tell people 
you get somebody, you get them hooked in, right? You have the conversation and they're like, this game sounds really cool. How do I start? Come over here. We're going to go look at all these boxes. They're called start collecting. You tell me which one you think is the coolest ones here. And I'll tell you a little bit about each army. And it usually just goes, goes from there. Yeah. Okay. This, they all, I'm sold in the start collector. What do I do now? You know? Right. Yeah. Um, I, I think cause, cause Warhammer is a game about factions. Um, and I think one of the core things about games workshop design, and this is, this is like, since they were making Warhammer as a product back in the, the, the eighties and stuff, where it's like, we're going to design a faction for every sense and sensibility. So people are going to have that feeling where it's like, I, I, I like that rough and tumble. I want the, I want those orcs. I want something where it's like, uh, I, I want to go very hard, very fast, very crazy. Um, you know, some people are like, I like the tree people. I want the tree people. I want the dinosaurs. Um, what yep. kid doesn't like dinosaurs? Yep. Uh, yeah. And yeah, so you, and you go on and on uh, with, with any number of them. Something is going to appeal to somebody. And uh and yeah, so you have to start collecting boxes, and sometimes even if they if they like, um, if if their sort of bullseye falls on one of the starter set factions, like Stormcast might want. Um, some Games Workshop still have all of the, those those corn value box sets because they didn't sell in 2015. Um, there's even smaller smaller box projects, or you can just hook them with that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The other one to come up more recently is the like I recently discovered what a good deal those Warcry boxes are. Yes, mm -hmm. I feel like those are a good like like okay, you got your start collecting box. Oh yeah, did I lose you guys? No, nope. no. Oh, uh, my end is frozen, but that's okay. I'll keep talking okay. if you can hear me. Yeah, no. So so we were we were talking about like so um. Not everyone is going to be like a gamer where it's like, I'm all in, I'm going to go home and I'm going to start building this 2000 point army so I can play like in a week or two, sometimes right. not even that much. Oh, I, I, I have stories about guys where it's like, they, they, they played a game with flesh eater courts next week. They came back with 2000 points painted corn. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Um, that's Todd, by the way, but if you remember him from the Brooklyn tournaments, Paul, did we lose Paul? I think we lost Paul. Uh oh. Oh no. Well, anyway, so we'll, we'll just talk about Warcry because we're still live, right? Yep. It's it's still uh uh still yeah we're still live. So anyway, um, I, some guys are it's like they're only going to be in a little bit. It's like I, I want to play with. Uh, I'm not I'm not so sure about Peyton. Uh, I, now I'm checking to see if your yours is frozen. Mine is frozen. No, I was checking to see if yours is frozen. Wait, super jealous about that. I was surprised to see us getting it. Yeah, oh, oh, um, they're talking about the Mortal Realms magazine. Yep. Uh, uh, guys in the chat, can you tell us if Paul is still there or not? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I guess we totally lost I Paul. Well, the thing is, modem runs on hamster power, so it probably was on its. Of course, uh, it does. At least you don't have the smoke detector thing. I would have been like, take that out of your wall now. <laughs> now he's gone. Okay, now it's just the two of us. This is now yeah, the Martin Dez. <laughs> all right. So, so have you played Warcry at all, Dez? Like oh, outside? Uh, okay, I, yeah, I've only played a handful of games. I know it's good. It's just I've only had an opportunity to play it with um, with with someone I don't think is a very uh, good gaming experience with. But I think it's it's a good tool. Um, absolutely and, i've run yeah. a couple campaigns already it's uh, gotten so many people like they i'm just doing this little war cry oh crap i've got a full age of sigmar army now yeah it's been it's been awesome oh yeah yeah and um i i was uh, gonna ask him when we run the magic thing i think that was what games workshops I, a mentality was when they created underworlds was to have that that card game aspect supplementing the miniatures game because it's not really a card game cards um, augment what your miniatures do on that board yep. um, but with the work right boxes especially with the, the holiday ones they just put out like the sylvaneth box is it the sylvaneth box the iron jaws box which has the best value i think it was the sylvaneth one because it comes with current uh, three current hunters um oh yeah and 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 stan caravan was saying ko um yeah uh so you start you start with a uh, war cry set you almost get them in where it's like 
hey, you only have to paint like here's Hero and like five infantry models and these two larger models, which are on like 40, 50 millimeter bases. Okay, now you buy another Hero. And then maybe they buy that actual start collecting box. Like start collecting is like step three. Yep. And then all of a sudden, they have like 750 points. You encourage them to, as their next purchase, because they're playing like smaller games. Because people who are starting newer, it's like, well, we're playing like a 560 point game because I have uh, these collection of boxes worth of stuff. Yep. It's like, well, here's how you get to that 1,000 point mark. And then all of a sudden, oh my God, you went from Warcry box to halfway. Now you're yep. halfway to uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, um, but the one, uh, this might, uh, I don't know how many years this might be going back for you when you started your hobby journey. Was terrain ever daunting for you? Like actually having to make and store it? Or were you always like, that's the game store's problem. I don't have to worry about actually having that. That's the game store's problem. It always has been. I don't I don't mess with terrain at all. I I, I, have, I buy it all the time, and then I, I never do anything with that. Piles of terrain, I don't do anything with. <laughs> I might buy it off of you for the GTA. Yeah. Let's put together that. <laughs> um, because that's one thing I have noticed that was like a lot of the Midwest community started with people in their basements and stuff. Yep. Um, and and it's I think something that we take for granted because I am trying to put together a GT. If this the virus thing didn't happen, I would have run my own GT in yep. October. And someone who has been hoarding terrain, and I now have a storage unit where all the stuff, like the as I paint it, it goes to the storage unit. It's like this stuff has to go somewhere when we're not using it, yeah. which is why I give uh, these conventions a lot of credit. Like I, it. No. It's, it's, you soon as like, oh wow, we expanded up to 200 players. You have any idea how much scenery that is? How many tables? Right. How many they, tables? That, that doesn't come out of nowhere. So um, it, it, it's, I always thought it'd be fun to run um, a, a huge, maybe not even start small, but like I'd love to do something totally Age of Sigmar narrative to yeah. see how many people would show up. Like, a, like, like the, or like Holy, Holy Wars is a good example of that, which started in a basement. Example. I'd love to do uh, something like Holy Wars, but where do I store all that crap? I, I have, I'm lucky, right. I live in Massachusetts, I have a big house, but I, I don't have enough to store 200 tables worth of terrain. Yeah. Yeah, oh, and, and Coach is saying he has his garage. Uh, Coach, do you park in your garage anymore? I'm um, just curious, because 500 <laughs> pieces of terrain probably sounds like you don't park in your garage anymore. Um, and there we go. Congratulations on 30 signed up for your narrative. And that, that's that's what we we all aspire to, regardless of what type of event we want to run. And that's the same thing with the uh, for newer players. I think it it shouldn't be taken for granted that um, game stores have a plethora of terrain, and like that may not that may not necessarily be the case. In the earlier game store I mentioned, they've had the same terrain since like 2013, 2014 when they opened, and it's not in the greatest shape. And so before the virus, I started bringing my own terrain to the games um, mm -hmm. because I was getting ready and I wanted to show off all the cool terrain I painted because I don't paint my crap. Uh, not not to, to belittle the stuff where it's like, I have to paint 150 Azerite rooms in three weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's that's different. But it's like, I, wanted, I want my games with my opponents to be a little bit of a better experience by painting more of that scenery for people. And I'm curious to see if that registers with some newer guys um, or gals. And it's like, do I also have to do the scenery stuff? That's just, where is that going to live? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're lucky. We have just probably maybe too much terrain at our LGS. We just ne never have to worry about it. And that, that, I have a table right here, but I usually play there. It's usually not too much to worry about. And it's nice because so, I run a lot of... Uh, uh, somebody mentioned like, yeah, Dan, Dan mentioned like doing uh, narrative leagues. I run Path to Glory a lot, uh, run a lot of slow grow leagues. And that's I just got a message from Paul. Paul. His yeah. computer restarted for some reason. And uh, we, nice. we talked about the stream a lot. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that, uh, there's a saying like narr narrative campaigns, slow grow escalation leagues are nice ways to get uh, players going. And we have enough terrain I, I don't even have to worry about it yeah um i I, w I will say this it's like um for for new for new players it's like you the, the the best way to go about it is like okay you have you found the hook um step two is you you get them over the fear of of the hobby element where it's like it just uh 
Oh, sorry that this more more, ch more chats done. I'm just trying to make sure it's like we're we're all doing okay. Um, so okay, you you've got them over the, the the hobby training wheels are on, saying this is okay. Painting is not out. The paintbrush isn't going to bite you. Um, it's okay to not paint like the people you see in the books and the magazines. Yep. Um, just paint paint to the level that you're comfortable with, and I and and and, and then. You, you figure out what, where, because some people do have a stop point where it's like, I only want to get into this for a little bit. Um, I also have magic. I also have D&D. &D. Perfectly okay with just playing with my War, War Cry Warband or um, uh, I wish uh, meeting engagements was a little bit more refined. Uh, I'm like one of two people on earth. It's like, I like the idea. Like, I think the scenarios are better than the format. Um, but that's, I think that's a separate, a separate show talking yeah. about it and, and just getting and getting into the nitty gritty of like, why does this exist? I, th I think, um, but I'm just using that as an example. People sometimes are just like, this is as much of I'm, uh, as I'm comfortable with getting into it. With, um, that might change later. They might get into it again more, but it's like, understand that some people do have a stopping point. Uh, you do have and, a lot of over people with D and D and stuff. And I, and I, a thought that just occurred to me is I've been using, contrast paints for my for all my war bands to show them like this took me 10 minutes with contrast paint this is what you can yeah. this is what you can do this is how and it's it's very simple marvel yeah. marvel crisis protocol same thing this is oh, what yeah you can yeah do very uh, i have a few guys in my community who's like asking um i told them uh he wanted me to paint a marvel crisis protocol figure for him and asked him which one he wanted it was ghost rider and i'm like pick pick something else please because <laughs> you know how i paint i'm like oh that motorcycle like if i wanted to paint the motorcycle right it'll take me days i can't I, I just bought it i have it over there ready to rock i can't wait <laughs> i'm pretty excited about it but yeah you're right so, that's time intensive i'm not going to contrast paint that <laughs> yeah um uh, it was already built for me dan so it was about the ghost writer and i'm like eh, oh oh next p pick another one p p pick something i can still oh. take my time to do uh, yeah, he already painted the whole because like, that's an easy one. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then I'm trying. I'm trying to think of what what other aspects of it there there might be. Because um, what? Uh, Paul. Oh. Whoop. Whoop. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. You move it. So my computer just like randomly decided to restart midstream. That was awesome. That's cool. It was no, already in dead no, show for again. That's fair. Okay. So you where guys, where did you guys leave off? We we were summarizing um, like sort of the war cry element and just like where where people like uh, uh, kind of can can get settled in like it's okay for people to have their stop stop points like you 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 can I think only lead people so far sometimes or it's like I'm comfortable with this i'm engaging with warhammer this much and i'm fine with that yep and well, i would say like what, what comes after war cry maybe um someone's first tournament i don't know if that's really the next step yeah maybe coming to regular club nights there we go that's the next step yep yeah Using so, so i guess the next thing you probably introduce people to is the general's handbook, right? Like we have to go from just your own army to how you actually play match play. Okay. Um, so how do you guys introduce the general's handbook concept to players? Um, Des, you want to take this or... Oh, that's funny. I was just thinking about that. I, I've been actually thinking about that sort of uh, like all day. Is it really necessary? Maybe that depends on what your meta is. I don't know. I was, I, that's something I was going back and forth on with myself all day. But I guess in in our particular area, we we play all of our missions straight out of uh, the general sandbox. So I would say it's pretty uh, pretty necessary. Um, it's definitely good for the updated rules in general and how Age of Sigmar works. A lot of stuff you could ignore in there, like nobody's really doing a lot of 
air battle, I don't think. I don't know. Um, yeah, General um, Sanders is a good place to start. After they've been playing a few games, I've been involved for a while. I wouldn't write straight up front and say, uh, with your start collecting, get this get this book. I would never say that. I would wait for, for them to build up their army, be really getting into it, and then I would be like, General's Handbook time. That's what we're all talking about here. I, I, I think that I actually said scenarios. People are going to ask themselves because um, – uh, whether we like it or not, there generally is a scenario or two in most battle tomes. Yep. And they may be very specialized in nature. And I do know people that play them. Like when they buy that book, it's like, well, here's a way to play Warhammer. Uh, there aren't scenarios right. in the core rules. No. There are scenarios yeah. in the core book. Oh, right? yeah. Not the core. Right. But um, not everyone buys the core book. You might buy the core book first for the lore, not necessarily for how to play, because there's a multitude of ways to gain access to the core rules without spending any money. And that's usually um, that I, I sell them on, you know, haha, it's free. I sell them on like you can get the rules online and play. So I so never try to the rule book. But. When, when people ask that question, when they get to that point of, well, um, is there a way to play other than just killing my friend's dudes? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then you say, well, okay, so there is a there is a book called the General's Handbook. It contains, um, like, we call them battle plans, but you can call them anything you want. Where it's like scenarios, um, like actual like ways to play beyond just that. Boom. Uh, and uh, I think that more than anything else um, opens so many doors. Not just like match play, like the concept of match play, I think, is sometimes a loaded term because mm -hmm. people might think match play and then immediately think tournaments. Yep. Um, and uh, any number of reasons why, but I think it's more seldom, seldom the general's handbook on those scenarios um, before like the concepts of here's the right way to play Age of Sigmar because uh, yep. some people may not want to do that. Uh, some people are going to be playing it like D&D. &D. Some people are going to be doing um, or just like just want to do the, the a style like open play. I don't think people who are newer go out of their way to look for this open war generators and all that all that cool stuff that exists and has its place. Mm -hmm. I don't think new people are beelining yes. for those. There we go. Open the open war cards. The open war cards. cards. Yeah, I use them for all the narrative campaigns and everything that I put together. I use those cards all the time. They're awesome. Yeah. But something as simple as understanding it's like, well, um, I wish this was in the general's handbook or if the, the scenario was free because I try and I use the scenario like border war. There's four objectives on the table. You know what they do. You set up a traditional way with the pitch battle style. Um, it, it, that's, there's a good reason why it's in the core book, but I wish it was more accessible than that. And like, I, I wish that's um, if if they were if we did the surveys again. Like, um, if you ever go to a big GT, and like last year at Nova and Adepticon, they were handing out the surveys, and you could have comment sections on the back. On um, I put put the specific scenario of border war at the back of the court rules for people to have access to. Like that's, in that's general, great. that's that's a really fun battle plan. Really simple to learn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and maybe include two diagrams, one for a four by four for smaller play and one for, um, uh, cause games workshop has been getting away in, in age of Sigmar specifically of using distances, not all of them, some of them do, but some of them just have, here's how far away the objectives are from each other. And yes, they have the, 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 the image of the rubble battle tiles under it. So you can, you who knows what a rubble battle tile is can kind of, um, just oppose like where this, the objectives are supposed to be, but, but it's not really all that clear. So I think if you have here's the four by six layout, here's a four by four slash three by three layout of where the objectives are supposed to go, you're done, and um, that gives people more more of a way to play. And I think that's where the general's handbook comes in mm -hmm. uh, for, for our players. Now for. Like introductory games, do you guys use uh, smaller boards than the four by six frequently? Absolutely, absolutely. Sometimes we use war cry board or four by four. Yeah, keep it simple, clean, not too much. Meeting, yeah. Meeting agents uses three by four, which is fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 
anyway, but yes, it's it's because um, if pe people are going to build their stuff like over time, like uh, what, while you were out, we we talked about um, like the 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 curve up with the hook. You start with the Warcry the Warcry value box, then they buy a hero that also goes in Warcry. Um, and then step three sometimes is the start collecting box. Like start, start collecting doesn't have to be step one. Sometimes it's step three. And all of a sudden they have like two or three full units, multiple characters. You get them to buy another box, maybe a monster box or something like that. And now they're just shy of a thousand points. So for their birthday or Christmas, they get um, that last box, which gets them to a thousand points. And all of a sudden you're halfway to 2000 points. And through whatever any course of events they can get to that next 2000 but you started with that Warcry value box and then you ended at a thousand points with those those tiny increments of well i should buy this and i also want that the, 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 those, those little those little purchases add up to, the, mm -hmm. to that value one and while you're in that in that that in between period you're probably playing on a smaller board Yep, yeah, like when we play Path to Glory, we usually play on four by fours. Yep. Did you want to talk about Path to Glory? Because I know you, 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 re you really champion that. Yeah, oh. I mean, I think that's a really great way to get new players into the game. Um, I think it's also for um, players that don't necessarily have 2,000 points mm -hmm. or or even a thousand points, like maybe they like just bought a start collecting box other than balancing on points. You can very easily just go to the path to glory tables and be like, okay, this is how many points in path to glory you're playing. Okay. I'll put together a force. That's the same size. Oh, 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 so, so, so someone like, uh, you would say like a newer player is, is playing, you're playing Path to Gore with someone, they are building it normally, you are coming in as basically the, the guest and saying, I will match that with my knowledge right. of match play experience. Okay, that's, that's, yeah, that's an yep. interesting way to go about it. So not both of you are actually engaging in the Path to Glory sort of lottery system, as well, you already have everything. Right. You, have, you mm -hmm. have several thousand points of painted stuff. Yeah. And also at the same time, like I'm playing the path to glory lottery. So I'm going to get a less than optimized list. So no. that you're not going to get your poo pushed in right away. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, you uh, said before the show, um, what do you like at a thousand points? Presumably with path to glory. It's like, well, not a lot of armies are optimized to have stuff at a thousand points. So maybe that problem solves itself. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, here's one that I have been sort of batting around that um, has been, like, advice I've been giving in some of my videos. But for, like, newer players, especially, like, for their, like, first thousand points, I usually don't advise people to get, like, the big models. And, like, a couple of reasons for that, like it's a big money investment to get one of those big models. It's a big uh, chunk of your army in one model. And so you're not exploring as much of the space in the game because you've sunk so much of your resources into one model. Yep. And it's also the bullet magnet. That's the first thing that's going to die. And then yeah, yeah. most of your army. Yep. Yeah. And there's very few armies where I'm like, yeah, in your first thousand points, you need a monster. Like, maybe if you're playing, like, Ogre Maw it's, Tribe. Yeah, it's very, it's very fa faction dependent. Yeah, um, faction dependent. Like, if you're playing Flesh Eater Quartz, your start collecting has a monster in it. Yep. And because and the, there is the appeal of those centerpiece models. Not all, right. not all um, armies have those titan slash centerpiece models our primarchs are 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 your your archeon your all rel um and i do i, I do want to emphasize like something like that it's like you, you you ask for that for christmas from from your spouse or maybe your child yeah. um if your child's old enough to spend their own life <laughs> or your parents if you still are uh right, right. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I i say that just because of a a, a story for for um uh, in the scale modelers meeting one of them it's like um 
is is he's an adult daughter and the, the, the daughter bought him a big warhammer model so it's like for christmas it's like okay why not so you want yeah. for christmas uh so so um i i think yet yeah, you recommend that later on in the, in in the, the sort of escalation towards that that complete collection, um, uh, presumably uh, unless you have one of those people where it's like, "F it, I'm all in." Uh, yeah. Oh, yep. because we, well, we see those posts on Facebook all the time, where it's like, "Yep, I just got got into," or, or I'm even if I'm switching factions, it's like, you know what? I've I've been in the game store for like 10, 15 years. I saw Warhammer. I'm in. And they post that haul of like six, seven hundred dollars worth of boxes. Um, yeah. <laughs> and well, we don't. Well, we don't really live in a region which takes advantage of it. I know the the Midwest has a guy named Mini Stomp, um, yep. which is or, and you can, uh, sw swap in Mini Stomp for any number of um, independent retailers, where they just they cut a percentage off of the product and they just um, make less profit off of it than say other stores. And it's like I will sell you this army for twenty percent off if you spend seven hundred dollars today. And some people are like, "I'm in. I'm all yep. about that." Yep. That's that's when I think it's okay to to buy the centerpiece model. But for someone where it's like um, trying to still understand what tree evidence are or or all the all those those new things, um, I, I think most armies, especially when you're playing at those lower point values, it's okay that you don't have a monster. And um, unless you're playing against someone who is not very cordial, uh, even when you lose games, I don't think it's going to be an out, it shouldn't really be an outright negative experience. If anything, it will leave them wanting, it should leave them wanting more, regardless of um, what models they end up purchasing next. Even if it's, I like the army I just got kicked in the face by. I want to buy that. Mm -hmm. that that's when you know that they had a good time. Yeah, that, that, that happened to me. I've uh, uh, playing either Stormcast or Undead or now Lumineth. Um, I've I've had people who went out to buy that army after they played a game with it with that, and I think that's a good sign of um, giving a good experience for people. Yep. You still there, Paul? Okay. So what else do you guys advise in, like, let's say somebody bought a start collecting box, right? And now they're like, they've got a little bit of the experience in and they're like, okay, I want to take this up to a thousand points. You know, they, they've seen the general's handbook. They understand what a thousand points means, what's match play all about. What stuff do you usually direct people at? Like we are already kind of said, the big models kind of leave those to the side until you have a bigger collection. But what stuff do you usually point people towards? I'll usually point them towards like something like an elite or something like that. Like if they bought, you know, a Vanguard box, like by, uh, what are they called? The Evocators and the Dracolines, something, something cool like that, that, that pops out to them, show them a few different elite boxes, make sure they said, you know, say, well, you know, maybe you want a box of Sacrosanct too. Then it'll give you a third battle line, and you'll be you know good to go later on once the points start piling up. Yeah, right. Um, for me, I I look at it depends on the collection they have. I look at like the the holes, like because um, it's also faction dependent what value boxes there are. We talked okay. about the warcry boxes. War, your value the value out of that that starter warcry box the first purchase they had may vary. Um, uh, sometimes either just through mis either mistakes or or because they really like that character, like they have multiples of a character, or th there's going to be a gap somewhere that I think it's important to fill saying, um, okay, you have you have a good amount of troops. Let's go for something elite, a little heavier hitter. Mm -hmm. um, or you have a lot of elite stuff. Let's try and fill out your, your anvil. Let's try and get you a little bit more on the side of getting those bodies in. So we're gonna go get a troop box with a lot of models, maybe like two of those boxes. Cause um, unfortunately, especially with the undead stuff, I, I find it to be, um, most of them do not come in twenties. I think only more tech come in twenties. The rest of them come in tens. So you're probably gonna try and convince them to get two of those boxes. So you can have a nice 20 block on the table uh, of like the chain rasps, the grave guard, like 
none of the, none of the undead stuff comes in twenties, unfortunately. So you might have to get them to buy two of those boxes, but it's worthwhile. So, but if they pick uh, the Iron Jaws, they hit the lottery because they have a great Warcry yes. box. They have a great Start Collecting box. You can just go like, I'm going to take two Start Collecting boxes and three Warcry boxes and a Maw Crusher, and I've got a 2,000 point army. Yep, right. But that's, even, that's the first part I said, I'm in. I'm just in with that. Um, yeah. But in that case, you have to ask them. But in the case of someone who did pick Iron Jaws, um, you have to ask them as they're playing their games, what do you, uh, because your army is only comprised of so many units, like ver ver uh, variations, what of the units that you have now do you wish you had more of? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yep. because that's the only question you can really ask someone like Iron Jaws or Lumineth or Fire Slayers. You don't have that variety really to pick from. So you have to try and double down. You, you're going to have to double down on something. Um, yeah. Unless they want to do allies or something like that. Or, uh, who knows? Uh, people play in any number of ways, not necessarily competitively. It's their hobby. Um, I think that's important to reinforce. It's like, understand what newer players, it's like their hobby may not be the expected baseline. Like we, we, we have a, a general understanding of what the baseline experience is because we're used to supporting, enjoying, and attending events where there's like 80 to 100 plus people there who have reached that same baseline. They are there for five games over two days, five or more, uh, doing this thing. Not everybody's about that. Yep. Uh, so once you understand uh, reinforcing what that limit is or where, where you think they might be going next, um, you can figure out what their shopping list should look like. For sure. Yeah. How about you, Des? What do you direct people to? What I'm else kidding. do you direct people to? It all depends on what, what army they're they're looking at, really. Um, but like a Iron Jaws, I would actually say get three star collectings and a maw crusher, and then you're then you're good. Yeah. I'll just say it really all depends on what they're what they're uh, what they're looking to play. Like I never say pick up two Vanguard boxes, you know start collecting boxes from strong castles. So, well, yeah, it all depends on the pick. Start collecting is probably always a good start, though. Yeah. There's a couple of armies that don't have them. And there's a couple of armies that have bad ones. Yeah. I'm trying to look. Who has a bad one? Cities uh, of Sigmar. Cities of Sigmar. I, I yeah, don't the think Vanguard box is terrible. Fire Slayers? I don't think that's very good. And that's, I think it's because the Volkites are so terrible now. <laughs> and sort of Magma Droths. Yep. Are we yeah, rating the box boxes now? What's that? Are we rating star collecting boxes now? <laughs> well, um, uh, kind of I just got a few more. So it's just like uh, when we came back, we were talking about the city's boxes, but um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there's some start collecting boxes that are bad, and yeah. there's some that are mediocre. There's and the couple of death ones. Yeah, there, there's a couple of the death ones that are like really awkward that are aligned to stuff that like the factions don't work like that anymore, and they still keep the start collecting boxes around. Yeah, I think the malignance one is the this is one you're pointing at where it's like there's a bunch of night haunt units, but it's led by a mortis engine. Yeah, yeah. And a mortis, and a mortis <laughs> engine doesn't go in those armies. <laughs> yeah, because it was built during a time where it's like because that was one of the first ones. Yeah, and they didn't. They didn't quite make the decision yet on how they wanted some of the armies to work. So it's what, like an idea, but what if? <laughs> uh, what if because it's like the Mortis engine is. It was still based on the Warhammer Fantasy Battles idea of what the Mortis engine is. It is a necromancer driving a ghost machine. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like it's technically ghost themed, and fits with these ghost units. And then you have the weird one where it's like it's. And a Mortark with ten, uh, 10 skeletons and five black knights, which is like points wise the most expensive um, start collecting box, I think, out of all of them, mm. which is really hysterical. Um, and it's like, I guess it's an HQ and two troops. It technically counts. Um, yep. But that's, that's why I said uh, everyone's going to have, um, have different holes in their collection because of the Warcry starting box they picked because of the characters they picked after that. Because I think that's usually step two as a hero, like for most people. Like if they if they picked like a little starting bundle, um, 
It's usually a character and then a star collecting box, um, which could have any number of things in it. There's, there's, there's going to be puzzle pieces where um, a suggestion to, to fix it, to try and make it a little bit more well-rounded. Is even um, even if the the player changes their mind and the meta shifts, or if they care about that, they they might want to adapt their collection as they go along. So I think that that one thousand point uh, sort of foundation should be as well rounded as possible. Mm -hmm. Even if they end up not using all of the miniatures from that one thousand points later, should reinforce that that's okay, and they'll probably be fine with that anyway. If they go on a certain direction for those next one thousand points. So what do you do when somebody is going to make a bad decision? <laughs> like, let's... I'll maybe frame it this way. The thing that snags somebody and is like, I need to get into this game, and it, it is because I need Archeon. Go for it. That's the thing that they want their first purchase. <clears throat> That's what's going to make you happy, motivate you, sit there and hobby paint build get you amped go for it and I still I have, Arion can be good oh he's 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 pretty right now he's pretty close to excellent um no i've i've had a few people uh, who have like they're only getting into aos after years of saying it's like i'm way in warhammer fantasy was that was the thing man and it's like uh, they, they are getting into it solely because of Archeon. I understand that um, we are taking advantage of probably not the best example, or it's like um, right, right. But or it's like they, they're picking something where um, a good a good example would be. Um, uh, oh, L'Oreal is a good place to start. Yeah, with. L'Oreal. Yeah, um, start starting in a place where it's like we we talked about a, like a, a, an ideal curve, where you go from a good value in a small amount of models to owning medium amount of models. And then um, once they get to that halfway mark, they can go in a lot of safe directions, which is which are understandable. Starting in a way which might hamstring them a little bit. Like, as you said, like a L'Oreal is probably the best example of, so, so say they have that, that, that one model and then they buy like a, of like a few troops. So all of a sudden they technically have a thousand points but they have this giant model, which might make other new players uncomfortable to play against. Mm -hmm. Because um, the power level of some of these units can be skewed in an amount equal to the lacking of knowledge by all of the players involved. You'll be surprised how many people say certain things either are just not fun to play against, not understanding that once they get into a tournament setting, that that is just not an optimal sort of output or unit, um, just like in any way. Uh, but if you're playing like six, 750 points and your opponent has a L'Oreal and like 20 Dryads and you're struggling with your 750 points to deal with a L'Oreal, you're probably not even playing a scenario because you haven't really understood what those are yet. Um, mm -hmm. That can lead to a negative play experience. Mm -hmm. So while you may not be able to stop someone from, because um, it is their hobby, and it's like, I'm gonna buy a L'Oreal. I wanna paint a L'Oreal. This is my favorite character when I was growing up reading Warhammer stories 20 years ago. She looks amazing now. I'm gonna buy her, I'm gonna play with her. I think it's important after watching the game between those two people where you have that sort of lopsided um, matchup of asking the person if, if either person walked away unhappy from that. Ask them, it's like, well, uh, what did you think about that game? Um, may I make a suggestion about what you can add to your collection going forward, which might be able to prevent that negative experience from happening again or yep. altering it yeah. in some way? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. I tend to do a lot of that, a lot of like put the newbies up against each other, let them play it out, and then ask them how their game went and what we're. Right. Yeah, well, I, I think specifically that that um, if you have like a club full of like a lot of newer players, um, or like people starting the hobby at the same time, yep. it's, I, um, I don't have a lot of experience with that. Like especially down in South Jersey, we tend to, as newer players are coming in, they would come in kind of like one at a time. So we had the ability of always like chaperoning them, for lack of a better word, with newer players. Um, but yeah, like um, I. Th 
that that's probably the best opportunity, the best experience is to have it when people play each other and learn the game together. Yep, that's what I try to do. We we, I mean, I think we get a pretty good influx of new players, and that's what I always try and set them up. I always make sure that if there's somebody new playing, I'm not playing. I'm watching what they're doing and trying to help them have the best play experience that they possibly can by helping them along with the rules. Maybe give them a little couple ideas of what they could have done better. I try not to do anything before, before they do anything. But afterwards, I always try to, you know, say, could have done this, could have done that. And it's, you know, it's fun to watch the light bulbs go out and see how they, if they had a negative play experience, which doesn't happen very often, how they could have done better, had more fun. Yeah. Right. No, I, th I think it's more important to ask questions because, mm -hmm. um, uh, that's the best way I've found to teach people the rules. Like, as the, um, it's like, cause, uh, the thing I, I know I struggled with, um, when I was teaching newer players Stormcast back when Stormcast was like, especially second edition where people are, it's, it's easier than ever to start a new Stormcast army. Um, and, uh, I would be like, I know all of this. I have memorized this book. Uh, and I, it's, 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 it's kind of just like bad form to just tell them. It's mm -hmm. like, I think it, it's more important to let people, and this is true for any skill. It's like, let someone learn. Um, and if they get it wrong, you correct them. Good. But it's, it's, they have the book, everything that they need is in front of them. It's only like 40 something pages. They will find the answer in there and just be patient and let them find it. Speaking of books, uh, War Scroll cards. Do you guys usually advise newer players to pick up the War Scroll cards? Absolutely, 100%. I love them. I think they're great. Uh -huh. You can lay out, or if you have an iPad or whatever, some sort of a tablet, yeah. you can use one of the army builders to look up the rules. But if they're not going to do that, I, I think the War Scroll cards are great. I buy them for for every army I have, when, especially when they yeah. come out. Uh, the app is generally very popular when I tell people about it. So it's like, I guess that's the same thing. Oh, did we lose yeah. Paul again? Yeah, it looks like we got the circle of doom. Yeah, there you go. Reboot it again. All right. Well, we were talking about the topic of, of War Scroll cards. Um, for me, I think the problem that I have with War Scroll cards is, especially since we've gotten into this sort of, we're not quite in a living, a living rule set yet. Uh, Games Workshop isn't as fast as, say, other game companies are. Uh, and so I, I try and shy away from this. Like I bought the like the War Scroll cards for all of the books as they as they came out for like the armies I collect. But um, pending FAQs and stuff like that. Oh, at least we were, got them. Yeah, Co Coach had had an idea. Yeah. We're, we're, that one was just my internet. <laughs> Coach buys the War so Scroll I, cards for the token. Yeah. Um, I, w I was saying I mainly get into the the app uh, because it ha it keeps the rules updated as Games Workshop tinkers with the app. Whereas with War Scroll cards, um, you uh, Don't play KO first edition KO and have War Scroll cards. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, like that's that sort of thing is is not necessarily <laughs> relevant for newer players. They're they're not going to go out looking for to ensure they are playing the most up-to-date and legal version of the game. Exactly. And that's why I so, say get them, play them, have, have fun. There's a quick reference for you to just look down at and you're ready to rock. Yeah. Um, and to answer Dan Caravan's question, I bought the War Scroll cards for the first and the second edition. Uh, no, the, the, uh, the original and the Sacrosanct Stormcast cards. But I've gotten rid of all of them since then because they're not really that useful. Especially yeah. once I memorize everything, but yeah, yeah. 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 that's one of those things that, like, for myself, I don't bother buying the War Scroll cards because I don't want to use them as a crutch. Um, but I'm a more experienced player, and I'm the kind of person that is very analytical, and I am going to like just comb through a book and memorize it, and that's the only way that I'm going to really internalize that army and understand it. Is to memorize all the war scrolls. I play too many the armies. One, I need them. <laughs> the, the one thing I wish that uh, they did, and this was uh, one of the cool things I like to. Did either have either of you ever played War Machine? Mm -hmm. 
So you like how War Machine, the card, um, well, the cards aren't laminated, but you could put them in sleeves, and they have the hitboxes at the bottom. Yep. And I wish that there was a way to do that for um, uh, the, the especially if, like for monsters and stuff like that, uh, where you can have, have them laminated so you can use a dry erase marker to keep track of hit points and stuff. Yeah. Like just, just, just small things like that. I know you can use hit tokens, like wound tokens and, and, and stuff like that, but but for me, I was just there's just little quirks from other games that I think would just enhance the uh, even the having the option, which is enhance the warrior. Just use dry uh, erase markers, yeah. Just like oh, yeah. yeah, but the yeah. cards of course are, locals, are not. Yeah, one of our locals actually does that for Warcry. She um like like all of the Warcry cards are small enough that they fit in sleeves. Yes, it, so she yeah, just screws up all of her Warcry cards and can just because she used to play War Machine. Yes. So, yeah, that that that's probably a little uh, bit more apt because it's the same miniature count really for Warcry versus War Machine of having and having those hit boxes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So so just 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 small things like that. Um, but yeah, the War, War Cry cards in general, sure. Um, I I think the app is just as useful. Um, it it also you can also buy the books. Um, one uh, I think one thing that uh, some some people overlook. Is um, the books like all of the rule books are available at a discounted price through the app? Or half uh, price. Like, I usually buy them on there. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, like for Broken Realms, because I'm only going to buy um, if there's a Lumineth expansion for Broken Realms, I will buy that version of it. But if not, I'm buying them all exclusively through the app. Especially since a lot of like, um, if I can't get in the store and postage is delayed, basically all over. Um, I'm just going to buy it that day. I'm going to read all the cool story. I'm going to have the rules in front of me. Just easy. Uh, so yeah, give people the uh, give people the choice of either the War Scroll cards if they don't want to buy those. The app is there, and I think it's important that we emphasize that there is a free app that people can can use. Uh, I it's just a I I just think it's it's just a it's a bizarre shame that um, the army builder in um, the, the Age of Sigmar app is a little, I think, harder to read than the War Scroll Builder, which is on the community site. Um, other than that, I love the app. Yep. Yeah. That's uh, also just a really useful tool. The uh, scrollbuilder.com is, yeah. like, I, that's, like, always. Where you, you, you do not build scrolls. <laughs> yeah, well now now we need, I guess, what would it be? Like a listbuilder.com for uh Anvil of Apotheosis? Oh uh, yes, yes. Yeah, where you, where you uh customize your character and whatnot. Yeah. I have actually not really taken that much of a look at it yet, but as soon as there's an event I want to attend where that's sort of a thing, I'll take a closer look and sort of build something for that. Uh, but th this this is just uh, uh, because of how Lumineth work. I would take Lumineth with a character like that to an event. Um, Anvil of Apotheosis, I would have to get okay from the TO for extra keyword access. Otherwise, it's like this character doesn't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> might, as, might as well be Gotrek uh, for fewer points and doesn't kill as much. Um, yeah. But it's, it's still look fun. I, I would read through it. I only think Skeven, 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 Skeven. <laughs> so do you guys steer people away from any armies when they're just starting out? Like if, you know, Dez just said Skaven, it, it made me think of that. Because I feel like Skaven's one of those armies that you might not want a new player to get into. I, I would never, I would never do that. I would never, and that's what I hate when like other people start coming around and like giving their two cents and they're talking like high level meta stuff and just let, the, let these people just look at models and, and think they're cool. If somebody thinks yeah. army is cool enough to play like Skaven, they're going to learn how to play them. Simple as that, even if it is more complicated, but they're, they're going to learn because they want to. Yeah. They're, um, they're point. The only uh, I actually do uh, try and steer people towards um, uh, kits, but it's it's more based on how the kit goes together. Like, but there's a lot more intricate parts 
that's like the, if they're not used to the model kit aspect or the painting aspect. Like which the, is new why are, huh? the new Necrons are ter terrible. <laughs> uh, I, I, as just a general example, it's it's more like if they're new to the hobby element, um, yeah. them them getting into an a, a, an a faction where there's not a lot of easy to build kits and the 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 uh, painting them as well. Like uh, um, a good example of uh, we we all uh, friends of friend of the show Vincent Venturella when he's talking about the speed painting an army like in a weekend or 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 a week or something. He um, one of the key example uh, things to look for is like find an army which um, is friendly to messy paint jobs. Things like orcs, things like destruction armies, or or bad guy armies, or undead armies. Um, trying to sell, right, trying to sell someone on um, an, an intricate kind of elf army where there's uh, not necessarily those easy to build kits. I think is unless they they you, you you can generally gauge how committed they're going to be. But um, yeah, that's that's why it's like it's more it's more like an extra warning, not necessarily steering away from. Because if it's like I understand that extra hurdle, I'm going to try my best anyway. Uh, I'm trying to think of like the, the Sylvaneth Star Collecting Box is probably the trifecta of, um, regardless of how it plays in the game, it's it, it, it's still like on the weaker side. There's not a lot of punch in that in that box. Um, dryads are notoriously hard to build because they're an older kit, and there's not very neat joins on how those models go together. And uh, so there's yeah there's there's twenty dryads there's a tree lord and there's like a character I think in there, but like it's still even then it's like that's relatively easy to paint. Um, what would be probably the best like the daughters of Cain is, the daughters of Cain star collecting box is some of the most intricate models in the game all crammed into one box. Cauldron of blood, a bunch of characters, a bunch of snakes, hundreds of bits for like armor and stuff like that. Um, we all are used to newer players who are not, you, not not understanding how much plastic glue to use. So you'll see people with like that spider webbing of stuff where it's like it's stuck to their fingers and it's just this just this this frayed sort of like big um, finger tests for the models. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and it's it's I mean stuff like that's okay. We all learn, but you want to minimize someone running into that issue. So that's the only time I think it would ever um, just add a caveat. Like these are a little intricate versus ogres. Is there a star collecting box from Watch Tribes? Yeah. Uh, there is for the OBR side. Yeah, I think that's that's what we're saying. BCR that's cool. or not BCR? Yeah, yeah. BCR. Yeah. It's getting late. My brain is not entirely here anymore, but we're still going, and that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, o OBR will be another one, um, but I, th I think that's also the benefit. Like, I hope uh, um, as we eventually get into a new edition of the game, that uh, we get a a new adversary faction picked for those start collecting sort of bundles where you have those easy to build miniatures. Um, I really appreciate that they did that with Night Haunt. Night Haunt is one of my favorite miniatures ranges. I think that they've ever done. Um, it's just genius all how all those model kits fit together. And a good, I want to say, like 20 to 25 percent of the range is easy to build kits. And that, neat. yes, but I, but I, um, for someone who's never really assembled a model kit before, sometimes the, the putting it together, especially like those, those tiny fiddly things like uh, Grim Guest Reapers out of the box box or sp oh. who here raise your hand if you've been frustrated just building and painting spirit building spirit hosts I have uh, never owned a death army uh, spirit hosts are notorious because it like the joins are very soft like it's not like a hard sort of of this it's sort of you're laying the spirit trails on each other like this and they don't always like because of gravity and stuff they don't stick together the right way 100% of the time. And if you're, it's, it, it can be very frustrating. So having access to all of these things, which are just two pieces, chain rasps together, 
um, Grim Gas Reapers, Ball, um, Peg and Socket. You're done. You're done. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's his name? Reichnor. I have Reichnor built upstairs. Um, he's like eight pieces. And you've seen how complex that model is. It's eight yep. pieces. And I think that that that's how you sell somebody. There's like really green in terms of how, how new they are to the hobby. Yep, I can agree with that. Yeah. I trying to think... Like the Skaven box, there's nothing really tough in that. I guess a screaming bell can be a little bit of a pain in the ass. That's about it. Yeah. No, I, stuff with a lot of small infantry ones. Like, um, did they ever? Uh, did they ever take that island of blood sprue and just turn it into a box, like um, for the clan rats? They should Cause have. Because they're just one piece, right? They don't even have the shield separate. It's just right. one. Yep. Uh -huh. just down on it. Well, the arm, uh, the weapon arm is separate. Oh yeah, it's just it's a uh, peg. You you put it hey, in. You peg and you're done. Yeah, you're right. done. I I I think um, in terms of starter models, like we 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 could do with more of that. Yep. Uh, yep. I wish they re-released that. Was such a good box set. Ugh. They re they re-released it um, sometime before second edition it was called like the spire of dawn because they had leftover boxes and they didn't know what to do with it because yep. so they just put that box together and then uh yeah, it sold out relatively quickly I, I uh, that. everybody on high elves yep yeah, all those high elf models are useless now aren't not they? necessarily um, i have a per i have a, i have a theory that um uh, in the new in the new Broken Realm set, they had um, Harkiron, which is basically all of Dark Elf. You can now play the entire Dark Elves range, past, present, and future, or past and present, um, with the exception of Malekith, because Malekith doesn't really have a model anymore. Um, but like one of four things can be Dark Elves, and you can have like a Dark Elf army. Uh, and I feel like there's room to do the same thing with Lumineth. And you can do like a Cities of Sigmar army where one in four units can be, um, yeah, one in four Cities of Sigmar units can be Lumineth. And they'll have a way to just like slice in a little bit of their allegiance abilities the same way. And um, I think if you want to make a, a, a true high elf themed Cities of Sigmar army, you take your old sword masters, you take your old spearmen, um, you take your old, um, I think you can use your old mages right now in Lumineth anyway. But you, you'll you'll have a home for all of your old high elf models to be fielded alongside uh, the new stuff, and that's that's just allegiance abilities. You don't have to release any specific characters or anything to make that happen. It's just like hard to run, but for high elves. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of potential, and there's like for people that want to get into the like building, converting, making a really customized cool army. Cities of Sigmar is like the place to go. Yep. Yeah. I, I hope over time those models become a little bit more readily available. Uh, Cause I know um, the, because it's mostly older models, um, they have to be repackaged and put round bases in with them, which is a little bit more intensive than um, most, most uh, factions out there now have just like, they've already been given that, that um, repackaging treatment. Uh, because it's, it's relatively hard to find Cities of Sigmar stuff in stores, right? Yeah, I believe the whole, almost all of Cities of Sigmar is uh, direct order only. Yeah. Over time, that'll probably improve. Yeah. Right now, I yeah. think there's a little bit more uh, different priorities on Kim's Workshop Spine right now. <laughs> yeah, like getting their release schedule back up to where it was supposed they to be. Where they want it to be, yeah. I mean, they're still booking like record profits anyway, but my yeah. God, like imagine how much more money they could be making. It's still debt. Yeah. yeah. So are there any other new player topics that you guys can think of that we haven't already touched on? I had one. Des? I can't think of one off the top of my head, so go ahead. Uh, well, I wanted to finish while, while Paul was fixing his computer. I was asking um, Des, it was a, a thing where it's like um, taking into consideration terrain. 
when you were, um, and I think this this is something that we some people may take for granted because we have access to really proactive game stores who who provide this sort of service. Um, but when you were getting into the game, Paul, and you were looking at the, did, did you ever imagine the aspect of like, am I going to have to build the scenery too? Did that, was that like sort of like a mental thing that you like considered? Um, well, I started playing in eighth edition. So, um, scenery wasn't as big of a thing in eighth edition as it is now. Um, and you know, the, the people that got me started on it, like literally the first game of Warhammer, well, actually it wasn't the first game of Warhammer. The second game of Warhammer I had ever seen was being played on a kitchen table. And the only terrain was a book in the middle of the table. Okay. That was just an impassable piece of terrain. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't really thinking that much about building terrain, but then um, I very quickly made my own table and started building terrain along with that. And um, I guess I was just introduced to the really cheap ways to make terrain early on. So yeah. it wasn't intimidating to me. It was just like, okay, you get some styrofoam and some paint and you just throw some stuff together and, and, and where do you keep it when, you, when you're done with it well i don't have that problem of okay. done with it. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. not a problem yeah. that I and i i understand i was just it's just something i always try and consider and talk about with people because it's like um we don't always either have the ability to, especially now we don't always have the ability to play at game stores we um or um especially uh, down where I live, not all game stores have an equal amount of terrain in equally good condition. Um, one of the game stores which is closest to me has not um, added to or um, uh, like basically furbished the terrain that they make uh, available for Warhammer players um, since like 2013, 2014 when the store opened. So it's seen a decent amount of wear. Some of it's just not painted. Like we have a lot of... Um, uh, uh, like stuff people would pay hundreds of dollars for a lot of the uh, witch fate tours, a lot of the warmer fantasy uh, scenery and it's just prime black. That's it. Like, and I would paint it, but I would also want to keep it afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, and try, I've actually talked to the store about that. It's like, I will buy, I, I uh, like, I will just buy this stuff off you. And it's like, they, they, cause they don't want to replace it. So it's like, it's not for sale. Uh, so I started bringing my own scenery for games. And I think it's important to reinforce with people. It's like, um, you, there are cost effective ways to make or, 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 or have like own scenery. Uh, one of the uh, things I appreciate the most, uh, getting back to work rise, this little battlefield in the box. Oh, like, yeah. uh, uh, and the the new ziggurats the forbidden power ones they are stackable which is like a, a a dream come true for someone who's a tournament organizer like me um if you just put a layer of like tissue paper in between each one you can stack i want to say nine or ten of those inside one little container that could fit probably your 2000 point army and i can unpack those and flock or, or whatever uh alongside those other things and I have three or four tables set up. So I, I just want to emphasize with newer players, you don't have to foot a big bill to pay for, to, to own the scenery. And it doesn't even have to look as nice as you see in the store to have fun with getting back to the book you used. To, um, and uh, this is a blast from the past. Des will like, um, when I started 40K, um, I believe fourth edition had only come out recently and i still have my fourth edition book because it has some of the coolest scratch built terrain ideas ever oh, yeah. yep and you use the books uh, like as 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 like elevation factors you throw over green felt you put some aquatic scenery stuff on top of it and yep. you're good to go and there's like even there's um a little books are still there for reference <laughs> yep. there's a there's a cutout in in there for like the ruined building 
like it um mm -hmm. it's uh, and then you you make it like you make it like a triangle it creates like a it's only about like this tall and but it's you if you build those like you just trace that pattern onto cardstock you um get textured primer or paint primer from like um michael's uh and you're done dry br uh, dry brush it like a, a brighter gray after that for a little bit of contrast and it's it's very easy to set, go, go from zero to set up and ready to play and there's a lot of stuff that you can get and use it as terrain that you can just go to a craft store. You can go to a dollar store, go pet to store. a pet store and go to the aquarium section and get the stuff from there. Um, it, you can get really cheap stuff to use as terrain that'll look decent and it's easy to get your hands on. You don't have to necessarily buy the hundred dollar piece of terrain from your hobby store uh, that games yeah. workshop or whoever is putting out, but there's also some inexpensive uh, like pre-built uh, pre-painted terrain out there too. That is, it's actually called battlefield in the box. I yeah, forget yeah. what brand is, it's called it's from Gale force nine battlefield in the box. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, you've seen that you've seen yeah. the same wizard tower like on every fourth or fifth table at every GT you've ever been to for the past fifteen years. Uh, oh, our uh, yeah. our FLGS has a whole bunch of that. Whole bunch. Yep. It's cool. Yeah. yeah, I mean it. It makes the table look yeah. nice really quick. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I think we've like hit all of the basic topics for uh, getting new players started. Yeah, they should leave all their questions in the comments. Yeah, that Get thing. Back. Leave your questions in the comments. Uh, I'm going to be. I'm working on a video for uh, new players as well. It's going to be about like your first thousand points. Um, you know, if you're starting from scratch. Uh, you know how to kind of get up to a thousand points what you need to think about um but other than that uh i think that's about it for now kids this has uh been fun thank you gentlemen for being on thank you for all having us uh, all right and we'll see you all later as soon as i hit this end broadcast button which is way across from where i was